um, talking with you about my new book and what we can learn from it. My new book, Think Outside the Building. Um, Think Outside the Building. And I'm here with some of my favorite friends and props, including um, Elmo, one of my favorite Muppets, and he will figure into my talk in a little while. But we need a little comic relief now, given these grim and very disturbing times. Um, I wrote Think Outside the Building about activism, innovation, change in institutions, including education, because we really are in very disturbing times. And in fact, we've known that for a while, even before the pandemic. In the first paragraph of the first real chapter of my book, I mention a whole litany of things we have to fix, including global pandemics that could fly to us on an airplane and suddenly spread. How did I know that? Well, I knew that because of watching other events in the world and because it seemed a likelihood. People say I could foretell the future. If I could foretell the future, you'll see by the end of this talk, it will be one where we use innovation to make a huge difference in the world. But I wrote the book in part because I had gone to way too many dinner parties accompanied by fine wines. So this is the first of my bumper stickers, which I'm going to use to help you find where I am in the talk. Um, and that is not a typo. I mean wines as in the complaining cry and not the alcoholic beverage. People like to whine and complain and often weren't doing anything about the root cause of the problems, which is institutions that don't change, where we get stuck in the past and we fail to innovate. And of course, that kind of attitude is very depressing. And I think too many people have it right now that, oh, there's nothing I can do about it. The problems are too hard. How can somebody like me make a difference? Well, as all of you know, who yourself are innovators or aspiring innovators, passivity is depressing. Only activity is energizing, doing something. But the doing, and then I promise this is my last attempt at comedy, doing is not a matter of cosmetic change. You know, trying to put lipstick on a bulldog. When you do that, when it's just cosmetic change, when you're not really digging down into the nature of institutions and the nature of ecosystems and the requirements of innovation, then you end up with lipstick on a bulldog. And that doesn't make change because first of all, it's a big ugly beast to begin with. The bulldog doesn't wanna change. You have to wrestle it to the ground. And when you end up, all you have is the same old ugly bulldog with a little bit of lipstick on it. And unfortunately, that's what too many attempts at change look like. You take the same structure and attempt to tweak it here, tweak it there. I fear that we haven't had enough time to truly innovate in K through 12 or higher education. And so a lot of it looks like lipstick on a bulldog, a few tweaks, a few um, air filters, a few hybrid classrooms, and we're trying to do the same old thing rather than thinking about new and innovative ways we could be using the city, our communities, technology to make a real difference. And that's what I mean by thinking outside the building. Thinking outside the building is getting outside of the structures and the assumptions that confine us. And too many of us are stuck in buildings because we're successful. It's one of the traps of success to begin to believe in the assumptions. Why? It has to be exactly the way it is. It can't possibly change. History leads us inevitably to this point. But in fact, all the institutions we have today, including our educational systems, they were all invented by people, many of whom had to step outside of the existing buildings 
to make change. And I realize that that issue of outside the building feels a little weird today because many of us are outside their buildings. I'm in my home office, not my Harvard Business School office, even though it's only a mile and a half away. Um, but I mean by the building, something more fundamental, those structures and assumptions that constrain. And when we're successful, we end up talking to people who are just like us, reinforcing our assumptions, surrounded by a lot of professions and professionalism, professionals and who have their own stake in maintaining the territory as it is. And one reason innovation and change are so difficult is because the nature of problems that are really worth solving, where innovation carries a big premium and has impact, is that those problems are very complex, they're multifaceted, they have multiple stakeholders, all of whom are pulling in different directions, they may have competing interests, and we have a little bit of stasis because nobody really wants to move or change. So the innovation process starts because somebody says, hey, this can be different. And they end up creating goals that are big, bold, imaginative goals. And so my first big principle of change is to dream bigger than you are. Entrepreneurship, the definition of entrepreneurship is that it involves acting when you don't control all the resources. You have an idea, but you have to find the resources. Well, dreaming bigger than you are is one of those steps towards successful entrepreneurship. It takes as much time and energy to dream small as it does to dream big. So you may as well dream big. And some of my favorite innovators in education have very big outside the building dreams. They often have those dreams, first of all, because they literally don't sit in the building. That is, they get outside of all the people who reinforce the status quo. They take random walks, wandering, far afield. I call them far afield trips discovering things that they didn't know existed that are far beyond conventional wisdom. They may, they may encounter people who are very different. Diversity is an aid to innovation, but not just substituting people of one body type for another body type. It's because people have different experiences somewhere, somehow, that trigger new thinking. And you know, we often don't get outside of our buildings. I'm gonna tell you a story about a phenomenal innovator in Brazil. And one of the trips on which I met him was such an example of all the people stuck inside buildings because I flew to Sao Paulo. I was, met at, I was going to do something for a bank. The bank was very interested in education, but it hadn't had much impact. I flew to Sao Paulo. I was met at the airport in a helicopter because of traffic in Sao Paulo. They flew me from the airport to the top of the bank building where I got out into an elevator, went down to the meeting room, gave my talk, then went down in the elevator to the garage where a car was waiting to take me to a hotel where I got in another car and went up to the lobby of the hotel in my hotel room. I was there for two days and I literally never saw the street. People who are successful can live in little bubbles where they never talk to those outside. The White House, unfortunately, is looking like one of those little kind of infectious bubbles right now. And excuse me for the editorial statement. So outside the building, dreaming bigger than you are. So in Brazil, I met an incredible innovator. He unfortunately died recently, but his name was Gilberto Dimenstein. And one of his early great ideas, he was a journalist, but he cared deeply 
about education and making a difference. And one of his early great ideas was something called a scola apprendis, which meant learning neighborhood. He said, why are schools in buildings? Why aren't the children learning from the whole neighborhood? And, and especially in Brazil, where they only went to school half a day. And so he mobilized actions that turned the neighborhood into an adjunct to the children's learning. He said it would have been too hard to tackle the public schools, government schools, hard to change those establishments, you know that. But by surrounding those schools with numerous learning opportunities in the neighborhood, he started raising educational achievement. He discovered that there was a lot of street art that was illegal, like graffiti. He not only made it legal, he made it famous. And those street artists now paint murals, sell their paintings at expensive galleries in New York. I can't afford their paintings. And it's become a tourist attraction to go to that part of Sao Paulo and see the murals that street kids had been painting. Well, his most important innovation outside the building was a very big dream that he could level the social divides in Brazil if everybody, poor and rich alike, had access to some of the same cultural and educational opportunities. So he started a digital platform called Catraca Livre, which in Portuguese means open turnstile, and he provided access to everything that was free in the city. He scaled it throughout Brazil. I wanted him to bring it to the state starting in Miami. He was content to do what he was doing. He began to develop millions and millions and millions of users who became one of the biggest digital platforms in Brazil. He won prizes all over the world. And then some big funds, George Soros, and also, I shouldn't say this, don't quote me, but Google wanted to buy it or buy into it. But to Gilberto, it was the dream. The dream was he was going to make a huge difference in his society. And he said, I walked away from them. They wanted to talk money. I wanted to talk dreams. He had a very big dream. He executed on it and he did not want to trade that dream for money. Now, I realize we need for-profit companies. It wasn't really clear whether Catraca Livra was for-profit because of his attitude, but yes, they had to make money. They had to sustain themselves, but they also wanted to have impact. And purpose and meaning is how we make a huge difference in the world. And we discover it by wandering far afield, talking to people who are different, and have new ideas triggered outside the establishment. Another person that I write about in my book, David Weinstein, I love his idea. It's an ed tech, an education company. He, he realized that there are a large number of tools dedicated to literacy, to reading, but very few dedicated to writing. And he worried that in the digital age with social media and short cryptic email or social media messages, people would lose the art of writing. So he started a platform for middle school students, writing contests, middle school and high school students. And he gained traction, he gained lots of users, and the education establishment was very interested in that. Well, why don't you do that for schools and with schools? And he wisely declined to do it initially. He had teachers that were helping him with it, but he wanted to establish his idea first outside of the mainstream. He felt it would be crushed by the people who thought the same way as they had always thought. And he grew it, it got bigger and bigger. Teachers discovered it on their own and started using it with their students. He's had partners, sports teams, contest to write about sports, about the environment, to write poetry. It's a beautiful thing. It's growing. And it's growing because his thinking was big and he did not compromise the big dream for the pragmatics of getting some people to do it with him. 
But on the other hand, that's not always a bad thing because in order to get innovations to happen, particularly when you tackle the establishment with something new, with a new way of doing things, whether it's Khan Academy for videos where people teach themselves skills, boy, do we need that now as we're scrambling for new curriculum in this age of coronavirus. You need partners. You can't grow. You can't innovate by yourself. And you need those partners far afield and sometimes outside of your own sector or familiar territory. So my next principle of innovation is it takes not a village. We have that old African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes more than a village. It takes a cross-sector multi-stakeholder coalition. Well, I realize that doesn't exactly trip off the tongue, but it's the way we get things done. We work outside our familiar sector. And I'm gonna give you some, idea, some examples in education that I think are just incredible. One brings me back to Elmo, my friend Elmo, and the other Muppets. Sesame, Sesame Street, Sesame Workshop, was a huge disruptive educational innovation when it started 50 years ago. Early childhood, education through broadcasting. And it was a TV program and a lot of merchandise, licensing, all those toys, Sesame branded, very successful for a long time. But then they got stuck in their own building of broadcast TV. And along came cable and other characters like, I don't know if you follow early childhood, but Dora the Explorer. Now, personally, I know Dora teaches Spanish and I know young kids adore Dora. I find Dora a little boring compared to those Muppets. Sorry about that. But Dora used new technology. Dora used animation. It was a lot cheaper to make Dora because she didn't have human characters. Dora had uh, the power of the funding of commercial TV behind her. Sesame Street did not. And so the Muppets got kind of sick. Sesame Street was declining. Sesame Street was losing money. And about six years ago, it was running out of money to make any new episodes. And along came a new CEO, an innovator. He was in my program at Harvard. I love him. He turned it around by pure outside the building thinking. Everyone thought of Sesame as broadcast TV through public television with some international licenses and a lot of merchandise. He thought more imaginatively. First of all, they don't have to be broadcast TV through public television. He made a partnership with HBO, commercial television, where you can imagine the horror. You're always greeting innovation. People are always greeting innovation with dismay and skepticism. Is Big Bird selling out? Elmo going commercial? Horrors. Well, in fact, HBO made a deal with Sesame, gave the money for new episodes, and with a deal that in nine months, public television could offer all those episodes for free. It enlarged the audience dramatically. It provided funding, and it was one of the moves to say, it's possible to work outside the sector. They changed their partnership to start more digital partnerships, to work with IBM, to use Watson artificial intelligence, to make customized learning based on Sesame episodes. They started working with digital startups, reading apps and other things for children. Moving outside the building enlarged the horizons dramatically. And they didn't give up their big dream, purpose and meaning, change the world. They changed their mission statement, but not their mission. Their mission statement became to make kids 
smarter, stronger, and kinder. So they partnered with the International Rescue Committee on the philanthropic side. They not only grew via commercial partnerships, they grew via philanthropic partnerships. And with the International Rescue Committee, they applied for a grant to bring their tools of early childhood education to refugee camps in the Middle East. A big, big problem. MacArthur Foundation had a competition called 100 and Change. It was for one $100 million grant that would be the one with the most to, to the organization with the greatest opportunity to have big impact on the world. Sesame and the International Rescue Committee won that competition. So now they have commercial partnerships all over the place. They have a huge philanthropic partnership. They started making Muslim Muppets. They got another award for an artistic Muppet. Their horizons enlarged because they went outside the confines of traditional assumptions. And in fact, their latest partnerships, you may have seen it on CNN, over the few months when the COVID crisis was just beginning, they started CNN town halls for children. And then they've had another one this fall and they had one on racial justice. A new partnership with CNN, the Muppets, and CNN anchors and experts to bring their tools into every home. It's very inspiring, but it's also for you innovators out there, smart business. Resources are flowing into Sesame and they have a new street in Manhattan. Um, it's West 63rd between Broadway and Avenue of the Americas is now named with the street sign and all Sesame Street. So those cross-sector multi-stakeholder coalitions really work. My other example is IBM's partnership with the K through 12 public schools and community colleges to reinvent high schools. Now that's a big deal and a big dream. IBM created the idea of the six year high school. Now there had been early college high schools in some cities, including New York City. So it wasn't unheard of, but think about this. This is the first major reinvention of high school since high school was invented in my home state of Massachusetts or free public high school in the last century. So IBM had this idea, six year high school that would combine K through 12 high school graduation with a community college graduation and training for jobs of the future, tech jobs of the future. Now, when I first heard that idea, I was a little upset because personally I hated high school and couldn't wait to get out. So the idea that it would be six years seemed like too much. Well, in fact, they started it in New York and Brooklyn in 2011 in the first class of students, they had 99% attendance. The students loved it. They loved the practical real world hands-on tech training. They loved the internship. They loved the promise of a job interview when they finished. And so in that first class, there were four students, maybe six, I'm trying to remember the exact number without looking it up, that graduated from a six year program in four years. And one of them got a $50,000 a year job at IBM while studying to finish a bachelor's degree and go on for a PhD. A huge impact on education that is now scaled to 200 across the United States, including, including internationally in Australia, in the UK, Morocco. It's, um, considered a big success, and it's highly imaginative. It is a cross-sector, multi-stakeholder coalition. It's an employer partner with the K through 12 public schools, with the community colleges, 
which often had never even talked to each other, and in places where there aren't a big tech employer who can promise the job, they have, like in rural areas, they have created coalitions of the hospital, the supermarket chain, all of whom need tech, and they are educating students for skills of the future in a very outside the building way. So these are exciting, big innovations. Smaller innovations also need an ecosystem of partners in order to do anything. A startup that I'm very fond of called Caribou, maybe the co-founder and CEO is watching right now. Caribou is a reading app for remote reading so that you can read to children or play games um, remotely and be looking at the same thing. It's like Kindle meets Facebook, FaceTime. Um, very imaginative, great technology, all kinds of awards. Well, in order to grow that, the CEO, a woman had to go not only to pitch contests to get money, financing, but had to think about customers. Where are the customers gonna come from? People don't necessarily download new apps just like that. It requires some education. And so went to partners, thought, gee, this must have a lot of military applications for parents who are deployed somewhere else and yet want to read to their children at night at bedtime. And so made partnerships with the military, gave it away for a while and then gained customers had to make partnerships with the publishers to get the books loaded onto the app that could be read. Making partnerships with employers, especially now who want to give amenities to parents or grandparents. Grandparents have been a big market who want to be able to stay in contact and feel that they're having human contact. A tremendous app that probably has a lot of applications in the classroom too, but it's very outside the building, especially because we know that reading to children makes a huge difference in educational attainment. Well, as this company, Caribou, has gone through COVID, it has realized that innovation doesn't stop. You have to build an ecosystem of partners and also adjacent products. So they've started doing games that can be used with older children. Besides baking bread, playing games together has been a very popular COVID application. And imagine doing that across physical divides. So these cross-sector, multi-stakeholder coalitions are becoming the villages that raise a child. But of course, it's not all smooth sailing because of my next principle and bumper sticker, and it's what I call Cantor's Law. Everybody should have a name, a law named after them, even if you have to name it yourself, as I did. Cantor's Law says that everything can look like a failure in the middle. So innovation, if, especially if it's new and different, the, more, the newer and the more different it is, the more bumps in the road it's going to hit along a journey that nobody had ever done before. They all start out small and vulnerable and you line up your allies and you have partner organizations and suddenly somebody leaves and you have to start all over again selling that organization on being your partner. Or like COVID, you hit a crisis that nobody knew was there and you have to pivot and be flexible. So that happened to Rich Fahey and Bob Sodic, whose innovation was affordable solar energy, solar cells for West Africa. And that actually is also, not, is also an education innovation as well as green energy. Because if kids can't read at night, if families aren't on the grid, as 97% of the people in one country weren't, and if they didn't have a generator, as a high proportion of the people didn't, how were kids going to do their homework and get educated? 
So this was an energy and an education innovation. And all of a sudden, as they were about to launch, having faced a lot of small crises, such as embezzlement, solar cells that didn't work, having to be flexible and pivot and hire street kids who knew how to fix cars to fix the solar cells, all of a sudden, Ebola struck. That's one of the reasons I know about pandemics. Ebola struck. What are they going to do now? They have to close everything in Monrovia, Liberia, their first major location. They had to close everything. But what gets us through the middles are our big dream, our purpose and values, that we have to care about people, we have to care about doing everything we can to accomplish the dream, because it's not just to make money, it's to have impact on the world. So they went back to their values and said, yes, we've got to keep this going. And as their employees had to go home and stay home as the city shut down, they gave all of them an extra month's pay in advance so they could take care of their families. And when the city opened up again, they had immense loyalty. People came back and suddenly new partners wanted to be associated with them. Multinational corporations that were not that pleased with corrupt government energy companies came to the solar energy company, Liberia Energy Network, and they were off and running. They had gotten over the miserable middles by staying true to their values. Innovation is never smooth. You're constantly re-innovating in the midst of an innovation. Business plans, business plans are not worth much more than what they are on paper. They're your best guess. You can't know. You have to keep innovating and pivoting. And you do that because of the power of your values, the big dream, because you have partners that won't let you fail. How do you walk away from your partners and say, oh, sorry, the work is too hard. And so you keep going because of what all of this brings to light, the optimism of activism. If those fine wines get you down, just remember that doing anything is better than doing nothing. Take a step, do proof of concept, keep pivoting, replicate, and even something that is met with skepticism at the beginning can be turned into a success. So I wrote this bumper sticker also as a hashtag um, because we have to move with the times. Well, thank you very much for letting me tell you about some of my tools and insights in, into innovation from my new book. Um, and I'm very happy to take questions and have some dialogue. And I think I have not only my home Zoom studio here, but I have part of my office here who's going to ask some of your questions. Hello, Rosabeth. Uh, we have had no questions come in during your talk, but we'll give a moment now for people to send in any questions they have for Professor Cantor. Thank you. Well, I could sing the Sesame Street song, but I don't think you want to hear that. I think GSV is dedicated to EdTech and to making a big difference in the world. And I hope that through these comments, you have gained a few insights. I tried to be a little quirky and also give you some very solid wisdom about what it takes to make innovation successful.